Hey there, YouTube, Travis here. So I've got something on the workbench tonight. This, as you might recognize, is a Pook E50 engine, all completely taken apart. This is the second time that this engine has come apart. I just recently rebuilt this a couple weeks ago, but here it is all torn up again. Uh, having an experience with this bike where, you know, you think you have everything assembled correctly, and when you go to start it, you realize you've either forgotten to include a piece or something is horribly wrong with your rebuild. And that's the experience I had with this engine. I wanted to make this video just to give some background on this project and just share how this really can happen to, to anyone, even on an engine, even when you're working on an engine as simple as a Pookie 50. So first, some background. This is the bike that the engine belongs on. This is one of the bikes that we got from Boise, Idaho, a few videos back. Uh, this one wound up in my personal collection. This is just a regular old two horsepower E50. Um, I wanted to make this a project where we did this rebuild on the cheap. So most all parts on this bike and most parts inside the engine are either the original parts or they were spares that I had lying around. There were a couple parts which I just couldn't get around having to buy new, obviously bearings and seals, and actually the piston, um, since that's a very, very specific Pook piston, but we'll get into that a little bit more later. I wanted to reuse as much as possible. I wanted to use as many good used parts. I wanted to save what we could and, and see if we could get this thing on the road for as little money as possible and just have a nice, reliable, rideable stocker. Um, things didn't necessarily go that way though. So taking it from the top, before even going into this engine, I wanted to make this a nice roller to make it easy to move around the garage and my backyard where I was temporarily storing it. If you look at this picture, you'll notice that the front forks are definitely bent. And so we sourced a nice set of front forks from Sabatino Vintage Moped and Scooter located here in Portland, Oregon. Uh, went ahead, installed these nice forks, and they actually look not too terrible on there. They're obviously original purple color that's been sun faded. Um, but put the forks on, and as we were doing that, worked our way down to the front wheel here. This wheel has a little bit of a wobble. I'm hoping with some chewing of the spokes we'll be able to save it. Um, the tires are both modern, still used tires. Uh, the very front tire came off of our Mini Magnum, and if you look closely, you can see that there's a little bit of rub on there from where this was rubbing the swing arm when this was first put on that bike. Um, so it shouldn't really affect things being on the front tire too much. Uh, and then the back, <laughs> this came off of the Pook Maxi N, actually. This is a uh, tire that was featured in my How to Change a Moped Tire video from 2013. <laughs> seven years ago, kind of crazy to think about. Um, but we got modern rubber on there because the stuff that was on there was completely junk. Um, the inner tubes were just, I had them kicking around. One was used, one was new. Um, still both modern inner tubes, nothing nothing ancient. Um, went ahead, the cables are all new. Um, ex and I had those sitting in bins with the exception of the throttle cable and then the throttle itself we're running a very similar, identical uh, Magura plastic assembly. Um, the original one was cracked right here and the cable would not sit in the housing. I had another one of these in a bin. Um, little bits and bobs for the levers I had to source that were just, just missing. Um, and then I simplified things a little bit. Um, I removed some, some of the wiring that's kind of redundant. Um, there's the switches that were on here were the plastic black style switches. Both of those were smashed. Um, and really on bikes, I like to wire them so that the lights are always on for safety, the headlight and the running light. So the switch is kind of redundant. Um, I deleted the horn off of this. Realistically, you can yell louder than the horn really is. I, even from my bikes that have it, I don't really use it unless I'm making a joke or a novelty. Um, so there's no more switches. Um, eventually I'll put another kill switch either up here at the handlebars or, or down there somewhere. Um, no speedometer, no speedometer light. Um, really just simplified the wiring on this one a little bit. Um, the tank is clean enough to run. That's a real saving grace on this bike. 
Um, I had a pet cock lying around. This is obviously for a top tank. It's not the, the right kind of pet cock because it comes off at an angle here. I have a proper one coming in the mail. This one is new and it leaks. Um, so that's not amazing. But uh, other minor things, I threw some more modern cheap pedals on it. I had to source one of my own crank arms for the left side because the threads were shot and it had been welded on. So um, that had to go. So from the get go, we were, we were doing pretty good. Um, hadn't really invested any actual money into this yet. And all the peripherals were, were replaced. The only thing that was left was the engine. So uh, we started to... So obviously this bike was seized. Uh, one Saturday, my buddy Andrew and I really tore into this thing. When we took the flywheel cover off, it was pretty obvious this bike had been sitting in water for some time. Water can easily get into these engines because of the vent hole uh, in the top of the cases on the transmission side. So this engine was bad. I didn't realize how bad it was going to be, though. This is the worst E50 I have ever rebuilt. Uh, I think some people might have scrapped everything but the cases, but this was a budget build, and we were really trying to reuse everything we could on this. So to start with, uh, it was seized, but after sitting overnight with some PB blaster on the piston, using a block of wood and a hammer, you know, I knew that this piston was not going to be savable, so I was okay beating on it until it, it went down in the cylinder. Once we got it unseized uh, and cracked the cases, that's where we really started to, to understand the true carnage on this. Um, this thing was bad. The main gear, the clutch bell were just caked in this, this just thick, hardened substance that you had to chip off. It was so bad. Um, we spent hours going tooth by tooth in the main gear, painstakingly getting this stuff out. Really, whatever happened, whatever process, chemical process inside that engine, it's put serious gouges in the main gear, uh, in the material for that, and in the clutch bell. Uh, even today, after a serious cleaning, you can see that's not gunk sitting on the outside. That is, those are indents, and, and this is just eaten away. Um, but even with this, we still saved everything internally with the exception of bearings and seals. Those were old. The original crankshaft was one solid piece and it wasn't really cost prohibitive to mail it out when I had a nice used crankshaft that actually was originally in the Pook Maxi M right there. That has a Rido crank now, a performance crank, but this is a fine stock crank. I've had it in a box for six years now. I um, finally had an opportunity to use it. This isn't ever going to be a crazy race bike. So the stock crank with the regular brass bushing and the small end is just fine. Um, and the piston obviously was, was, was totally gone. So we, I went ahead and sourced a high torque piston. Now the high torque series is different than a regular, regular Pook Maxi uh, top end. Obviously a high torque is cast iron. And then it's a dual ring piston setup, but the top ring is a Dykes ring. And uh, that helps you get higher compression. But that also means that these pistons are a little bit harder to come by and a little more expensive. This is a $60 piston. Um, and I was not super stoked. This is a number 11 piston. There's 11, 22, and 33. And then there's a corresponding number on the cylinder. Um, I was not super stoked on spending $60 on a stock piston because there are some cylinder kits, which for $20 or $30 more you could buy and have cylinder and piston. But we're going for a nice stock build here, and we're trying to use the original parts. Um, thankfully, the cylinder actually cleaned up. There was no serious gouges in it, which leads me to believe that this bike really was just sitting. Uh, it just sat. Maybe it was crashed and parked, but there wasn't catastrophic engine failure. You also got to see that number 11 up there too. Um, you know, it's a cast iron uh, cylinder and they have a special, special head. So this was all savable, which was cool. So even though this project turned out to be a bit of a headache, as always, there's nothing is, is for naught. Um, I learned an awful lot about troubleshooting Pook ignition systems, so much so that it's probably going to be an upcoming video. I had quite a, an interesting and sort of fun time <laughs> diagnosing the stock stator. Um, again, I wanted to build this bike on the cheap 
to be reliable. Um, and I think the stock points are a really nice place to start. These points obviously look really rough on this stator. Um, the points themselves are clean because those are replacement points, but I'll get to that in a second. I was having a really, really strange set of symptoms with this bike. I had no spark um, once the bike was all reassembled, um, no spark. But when I put my test light to the blue wire coming out of the coil, which is the power, uh, the test light lit up. When I put my multimeter on it, I had almost six volts. I had 5.9 volts. So I said to myself, okay, and the bike has been timed. I said to myself in the point gap set and then timed, you know, well, you know, everything should be working. The, the getting power output here. So I'm getting power from the stator. Then clearly one of the other components must be at fault here. It must be the high tension coil. It must be the spark plug wire or boot. Surely those, one of those are the culprits. Well, I have a nice bag of coils here. Uh, and I have a few condensers. Went through the testing process for the coils tested in the spark plug boot and wire with a multimeter. You test for continuity. No problems there. Tested the grounds. Had continuity between the ground wire and the wiring terminal and the coil and the rest of the bike, the engine. Continuity there, no problem. Tested the resistance and the ignition high tension coil itself. Seem to be getting readings off of that. And also, just from an anecdotal standpoint, these black ignition coils, the Bosch coils, those rarely go bad. I mean, they're they're sealed. Normally, they're not a problem. Um, when you start looking at issues with ignition coils, if it's physically, you can see that it's cracked, and that's a little more common on, like, Navi coil from a Moto Bacane. You know, that that's that's more common. Really, those Bosch ones are, are fine. I even looked at the condenser, and on the Moped Army Wiki, it'll tell you that if you have a bad internal condenser, normally it sits right here. You can see I've replaced it. You could wire in an external one and, and leave the first one there, which is sort of true. If you do that, you have to have, the condenser has to have failed in a particular way. The test I did for the condenser was I set my multimeter to ohms. Uh, and I went ahead and, and, and put my test leads on that and I watched it kind of go up to infinity. Um, but that wasn't the issue either. Just out of insane paranoia, I replaced it with a known good condenser. I have an external condenser wired in. And so the two wires in here are just wired together. Still though, no spark. Finally, I decided to just replace the ignition points. The points that were on here, clean as a whistle at this point. Um, they were clean as a whistle. There was plenty of meat on them, on the, the, the contact material, but I replaced them. Sure enough, when I went ahead and reassembled, fat blue spark. I don't know what it was about the points. They were opening and closing just fine when I eyeballed it. They were clean, they had material on them. The wire seemed okay, but for some reason, it was the points. And this is from a, another Pook Stator. This is a good used set I had kicking around. So still didn't have to buy anything. But man, that was a massive amount of troubleshooting. This bike was reassembled. Um, I even took apart the stock exhaust and cleaned it out. You had to do the trick where you put the broom handle in the exhaust and, and pound out the inner baffle. So exhaust was clean. So there was going to be no dirty exhaust. We have fat spark. Um, the carb. Uh, is the original carb. This is a 12 carb made into a 14 intake. Um, just in the interest of time, I had a clone 15 Bing that I put on there just, and I put an appropriate size jet. I put a low 60s jet in there just to get this thing to run. Um, and then the spark plug was plenty wet and the bowl was filling up. I had fuel. I had spark. I had a compression with my nice new piston in my top end. Um, I even put a Harbor Freight compression tester on it and got 60 PSI, just like all my other bikes that that tester reads low for. But yet, it wouldn't run. It wouldn't run, and it was driving me insane. And it also was making this horrible ear-piercing sound. I'm sorry to folks who have headphones. Bear with me here. So what could that be? Well, my first thoughts were, 
you know, the seals that are sitting on the crankshaft there, I didn't grease those seals. I like to grease seals when I put them on. You grease the inside of the seal lip, it slides on real nice. I didn't do that on the crankshaft. Um, I just didn't do it this time I built it, and I think that might have been my downfall. Um, I've built other E50s, and that's never been an issue before, uh, but I fear that that might be an issue here. So we're going to go ahead, pop these seals off, and see what they look like, and then reassemble. So that could be my horrible squealing sound. If that seal is somehow getting twisted and, and pushed around, that would cause a major air leak and could cause me to have a no-start symptom. I could barely get it to start at full choke and pedaling my brains out, but it's still very unsatisfying. So that could be it. Whew. This has been a much more time-consuming project than I originally thought. You know, I was kind of thinking okay, we'll slap this maxi back together and have a nice stock runner. Um, I wasn't prepared to be dealing with the massive amounts of grime and, and caked on bits in this engine. This thing, this thing was a real piece of work. But I think we're getting close to the end here. I'm going to reassemble this motor, and we're going to see if we get lucky. Uh, but I do need to replace the seal on the crankshaft just to make sure I'm covering my bases here with that horrible loud squeak. I only have to pull one bearing. It's the snap ring bearing that's on the clutch side. So that needs to come out. So I'm assembling the Harbor Freight bearing pulling and separator right now so that we can pull this bearing. And then lucky for me, uh, in my kitchen a few weeks ago, my roommate had a mishap where we left a piece of toast in our toaster oven and it ended up ruining it. So we now have this nice uh, garage toaster oven, which as you can see, has really uh, turned. It's nice charred, everything in there, and it smells really bad. But we can now heat up the bearing for reassembly back onto the crank here. So pull this bearing, replace the seal, and away we go. Well, with the clutch seal, I see some indentations, like this thing just maybe got pushed up against the webs of the crank there. Maybe. But I don't know if that'd be enough to deform it to create an air leak for it to not start. You know, both the springs are in place on both of these old seals. This top one's a Viton seal, which is a nicer one. Um, but uh, we're going to reinstall the seal with grease this time around. And we've got our one snap ring bearing cooking away. So we'll go ahead and get that reinstalled here. And then we can slap the bike engine back together. Yes, it is alive. Well, it was alive. <laughs> We're getting there. Uh, still need to do some fine tuning on this guy, but uh, I just took it down the street. There's no kill switch. There's no brakes, but uh, it seemed to go pretty close to 30. It seemed to get up to power just fine. This thing runs and it runs pretty smooth. It starts up easy. Um, I just need to tune that carb. The float needle is not sealing. It's leaking gas all over the ground, but this is a start. Anyway, this has been fun. Um, just a good lesson in, in realizing that, you know, you have to keep at things. Sometimes you don't get it right the first time, and that's okay. All right there, YouTube. Well, still out here, still building mopeds. Hope you learned something along the way. More tutorial videos coming soon. Until next time.